Hello, everybody. Welcome to Digital Hammurabi. Uh, I am Megan Lewis. For those of you who are new to the show, I run the channel with my husband, Dr. Joshua Bowen. And today we are very excited to be joined by Dr. Aaron Thompson, who is an actual art crime professor, which I didn't actually know was a job until a couple of weeks ago. So this is going to be very exciting. Um, Dr. Thompson works at um, uh, College University of New York, um, has recently published uh, a book called Possession, The Curious History of Private Collectors. There is a link in the description if this interview interests you and you'd like to find out more about Dr. Thompson and her work. And her most notable claim to fame is that she has recently been denounced by Tucker Carlson or Carlson Tucker. I get his names the wrong way around, but she's officially denounced. So, you know, we're in good, wonderful company here. Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, would you mind just opening by telling us a little bit about yourself, how you got into the field of art crime, which again, just sounds absolutely fantastic. Uh, well, I made a lot of decisions that make sense only in retrospect. <laughs> so um, from the slogging through them point of view, I was getting my PhD in art history and I thought, I'm never going to get a job as an art historian. Um, so as many of us do. <laughs> uh, I decided to go to law school, um, which I did. So I finished my um, dissertation, my PhD and my JD at the same time. And then I worked as a, a lawyer lawyer for a couple of years. And then um, this position came up. So I teach at John Jay College at CUNY and they were looking for someone with a PhD in art history and a JD to teach art crime. And I was like, uh, uh, I I'm like the only person in the world with those qualifications. <laughs> um, so uh, academia is actually my alt ac career, I guess, <laughs> in background. Um, but uh, I had been writing about um, art crime issues while a lawyer lawyer um, because I was very interested in forgeries. So I was writing my dissertation on ancient Greek vases and there was a group of them that were so strange in their imagery that prior scholars had said, oh, th these just must be fakes because mm -hmm essentially they were making a lot of poop jokes and and scholars were like that's that's not the good. ancient greeks were far too cultured and civilized for poop jokes yeah. um so i thought i started to think about well how can you actually tell when something is genuine or not for an antiquity uh and i realized that all of the assumptions that i had about that that if it's in a museum it must be genuine uh are uh, not really supported that there is mm -hmm. far less reliability for scientific testing, far less scientific testing actually takes place. Um, and the only way I think that you can definitely know something is authentic is if it comes from uh, scientific excavation. And so I got very interested in, well, how do pieces end up in collections if not through excavation? And, you know, started delving into the steamy world of art looting and smuggling and theft and forgery and really have not emerged since so. <laughs> wonderful thank you very much for that um I, and something that um i recently found out uh, along the same lines of your as your um understanding that objects in museums aren't necessarily authentic um is the and we'll talk about this in a couple of minutes um the fact that you have the same issue with auction houses uh, which I, we, I spoke to Dr. Patty Gustenbuth a couple of weeks ago, and I was honestly shocked to find out that actually due diligence a lot of times is not done um, by people that you would expect to do that kind of work to actually verify that what they have is both authentic and legally in their possession. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very interesting um, world. So um, one of the well, two of the terms that often come up when we're talking about um, antiquities and artifacts. Uh, providence and provenience. Um, and I don't think I've ever sat down and really asked someone to explain the difference between those two. So would you mind just going through the distinction for us? Sure. So it's uh, a simple answer with a whole lot writing on it, <laughs> depending on who you ask. So uh, they both, confusingly enough, come from the same French word, provenir, where something comes from. So provenance is what we use to mean the ownership history of a thing. Um, provenience is more a narrow piece of that where it was found. Um, so fine spot versus what has happened between antiquity and the present. So you can think of provenience as what usually goes up on the label on a museum case. Mm -hmm. 
you know, ancient Sicily. Whatever. Excavated at Syria um, or something similar. Yes. Um, as if there was, uh, the object was made in antiquity, used in antiquity, deposited in a grave or fell into a trash heap or whatever, and then boom, magically appears in a plexiglass box in a museum 2,000 later, 2,000 years later, nothing matters. Definitely but, how it happens. Yeah, exactly. Um, so provenance is, well, who owned it in between? So obviously with an archeological object, um, that can be impossible to trace. Um, it's only rare cases where we know exactly where something came from. And also a lot of false information gets put into there. I mean, I don't mean lies, but you know, someone will say, well, I think it came from this or that, and mm -hmm. then that all gets bundled together. So um, in the past, people cared about provenance for authenticity reasons. Is, is, was this something that actually was made in antiquity and we can sort of trace who, how it came to us or does it just appear out of nowhere and therefore it, it might feel more likely to be a fake. Mm -hmm. um, today, people are also interested in ownership history for making sure that something was not looted um, and smuggled out of its country of origin. Um, to me, they go together, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes people only care about one or the other. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Thank you. So when we're looking specifically at antiquities available for purchase, why is it that provenance and provenience is a, a such important questions and important pieces of information? Well, there are definitely different answers to this question depending on what you care about. So I came into thinking about this from a very archaeological point of view, you know, what thinking about I want to only look at genuine antiquities um, in order to understand the, the truth of the past instead of something that somebody might have made up. And I want to make sure archaeological sites are not looted in order to produce objects to be sold in the marketplace because looting a site destroys the archaeological value of that site. Um, you might think that, oh, well, a vase is buried in a tomb and then it's taken from the tomb and put on the market. Who cares what information is lost? But you lose a huge amount of, of things. Um, for example, from the deposits on the inside of vases, we can know what they once held. We can trace ecological histories of the region. What did they grow? What did they live on? Um, what were they trading? And better understand the patterns of ecological change that we can use to fight climate change today to get on one of my hobby horses. Um, but there have been decades of archeologists telling people don't buy things without a good ownership history um, because you'll uh, you know, mess up my archeological site data. Mm -hmm. And people have been like, so what, it's pretty, I like it. So what I've been doing lately is thinking about, well, what are some other reasons to care about provenance um, that might resonate better with with buyers. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is what I tried to do for my book, Possession, was think about what do private collectors, so individual buyers of antiquity, what are they wanting from those purchases? So I can try and adjust the message to those desires. So I've been talking a lot lately about um, fakes because mm -hmm. people might think, you know, people do think of all sorts of reasons why it's not that bad to buy an object that was looted and smuggled out of a country of origin. Um, but nobody wants to be the person that other people are like, ha ha, did you see that ridiculous fake that they're mm. displaying as ancient Roman on their bookcase or something like that. Uh, so I think about fakes. And I also talk a lot about tax. I know, super sexy <laughs> topic. <of discussion. laughs> um, but I imagine very compelling for a certain class of collector. Because if you're spending a ton, uh, one of the reasons people like to buy antiquities is that they're a great investment um, because the market for them is pretty steady. But even if you can't resell it, you know, somebody, you know, the, the fashion for this type of antiquity falls or something. Uh, for, for decades, people in the U.S. have thought, well, no problem. I can just donate it to a museum and then get the tax deduction based on the, the full value of that um, donation. Uh, so in recent years, American museums have been making it harder and harder to donate objects. They won't accept objects without uh, a provenance, uh, without knowing where the object has been since at least 1970 
in mm -hmm. most cases. Um, plenty of loopholes still, but working on it. Um, and so I'm trying to tell buyers like, look, this is an investment decision that you don't want to buy something with bad provenance because you might not be able to recoup the value of your investment later. Plus, evidence of looting might emerge and then you'd have to surrender it and you'd lose all of your money right there. So it seems Regardless, like, yeah, yeah. Why, why risk your money that way? Excellent. Um, do you feel like people have been receptive to this kind of more financially based message? I hope so. You know, I haven't had somebody come to me and say, I'm no one's come and said, because of you, I decided not to buy this very shady looking artifact. <laughs> But I have had a lot of people say, oh, I didn't I didn't think of that before. Well, um, that's that's good. What I really want to do is persuade um, tax authorities to value at zero an unprovenanced antiquity. Oh, that would be wonderful. Because of the fact that it might not have, um, the owner might not have good title. And you can't mm -hmm. donate something you stole to a museum or... Uh, I'm not saying that owners of antiquities stole them, but you can't donate someone yeah. stolen that you don't have a good title to. So if mm -hmm. some country can come up and say, oh, here's evidence. That's of us. Nah. That would be awesome. Um, so the, the title of the video mentions eBay, um, and we'll get into that in a, a few minutes. But um, like I mentioned, this isn't just a problem for like eBay and for Facebook sales and like the black market of antiquities. Uh, auction houses aren't always as thorough as they should be or as we'd like. Um, with regard to establishing a clear chain of ownership, the, the provenance for objects they're selling. Um, is it, does do stolen or faked objects appear in auction houses very regularly or is this more of a, um, a, a rare occurrence? Uh, the more you look, the more you see. It's <laughs> amazing, actually. Um, just uh, two weeks ago, last in June this month, um, Christie's had to remove five lots, I think, from an antiquities auction um, because they were shown to have been looted. Uh, and there's one sort of treasure trove of photographic evidence of looting from the Giacomo Medici case. So Italian authorities seized the storehouse of this um, antiquity smuggler and um, he was a criminal mastermind in um, buying uh, antiquities that were accidentally uncovered by farmers in uh, hiring looters to dig up tombs in sometimes directing thefts to order from museums. Um, and then he placed these objects for decades um, in major collections, major museums. Uh, the one thing in which he was not a criminal mastermind is he kept exact records of all of his transactions. <laughs> not the best idea. Um, so uh, authorities have been over the years um, finding these objects when they come up for sale and and seizing them um so the big auction house is always complaining you know just give us the list um and we can make sure on our own that the objects that are offered to us are not on the list and the italian authorities say well if we gave if we made the list available then people would not these objects they wouldn't would come up for sale anyway yes that's a big debate um which i can see on both sides mm -hmm. but on the other hand there's in paris um in on the 29th of June, there's a sale in which uh, Benin bronze will be sold and a couple of um, idol statues from uh, that were taken from Nigeria during the Biafran war, um, during the, the uprest there, uh, unrest. Um, and people have pointed out, like, well, these are, are ethically very problematic objects that are just being offered with a sort of, well, no problem, you know, they're, mm -hmm. um, so different categories of what people would consider theft or morally problematic come up um, with different levels of discussion. So Nazi looted art is now something that auction houses are super on top of examining um, the provenance, the chain of custody of, of pieces that might possibly have been taken from Jewish families during World War II. Um, and they do not apply that same level of paranoid scrutiny. Uh, I, I, paranoid is the wrong word, but intense scrutiny mm -hmm. um, to the provenance of ancient pieces. So again, in June, um, an auction house was sued by the Museum of the Bible for, or for um, 
concealing the pro the bad provenance of um, an ancient tablet. Yeah. Uh, so there are all sorts of shenanigans happening in the sales world, which, as I tell people, is not surprising because you have to look at the the motivation. So if a dealer or an auction house doesn't sell something, they don't make money. <laughs> so problematic. It's just, it's just problematic. Um, so they want to they want customers to think of them as a place, a reliable place to buy um, good art um, that won't get them into trouble. But they also want to sell art. Um, and to me, as an archaeologist, if you are selling an antiquity that um, you don't have any indication of where it was before 1991, um, Christie's just had a sale in June in which a lot of the pieces were like this. It's not worth it. It was probably looted uh, mm. at some point. It's just that you can't prove it. And to me, the seller is sort of guessing that no claimant country will be able to prove it. So it's so why not? Yeah, uh, not cool. I think, but others disagree. Thank you. Um, one of my absolute favorite things about your Twitter feed, and if anyone here is on Twitter and is not following Dr. Thompson, please follow her, it's at our crime prof, uh, is um, the selection of badly faked antiquities that you find on eBay. The commentaries are absolutely hilarious. And if I can get it to work, I do have an example that I think you shared earlier this week um, that was just absolutely beautiful. Uh, uh, sorry, I have to work out. There we go. There we are. So it's there we are. So this delightful looking thing. <laughs> it is apparently a, a doll's head. Um, I think people would disagree that that is actually a doll's head, but apparently it is. Um, and then this wonderful explanation of why it looks quite as interesting as it does, because it's well faked apart from anything else. Um, but it's got a, a beautiful story about um, like someone, it was a broken foot from something and then it was carved into a doll's head for a child. And isn't this a wonderful, rare piece of antiquity? Um, and then uh, interestingly, the seller tries to claim um, that they are a member of the AIA, which is a professional institution for um, archeologists in America. And uh, I assume is trying to give a veneer of um, authenticity to the object that they are selling. Um, so there are a myriad of reasons why one should not buy, um, objects, ancient objects or objects purported to be ancient from eBay. Um, yes. How much fun do you have finding these fakes? Oh, it's so much fun. Also, somebody said of that one, uh, that, that, that head looked like Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I used to post only one a day, but that guy had like these novellas of description of fake provenance that <laughs> were amazing. So I really had to, to, to do that. And also I, I pointed out to the AI, like, we should, this, is, this is not cool. So they, they sat there sure. listening into it. <laughs> um, uh, it's both very fun to find these and very disheartening because mm -hmm. there are so many, I encourage you, just anybody can entertain themselves by searching ancient fill in the blank for sale um, on eBay, on Etsy, on just Google and see what you get. And um, there are such ridiculous things. M my favorite that I found so far, um, which is still on sale several years later because uh, it's $15,000. So a little bit of a high, a steep asking price is uh, they, the site euphemistically calls it an ancient Egyptian body part, um, but it is very erect looking penis, mummified, wrapped in, you know, mummy looking cloth. Which is, you know, I, I can't tell if things are forgeries just from looking at a photograph, but if that is authentic, either I am misunderstanding fundamental things about mummification or erections or both, but. <laughs> I think we're all misunderstanding fundamental things about erections, if this is a possibility. Um, but 
I what I'm trying to do by by tweeting about this is to maybe give people a little bit of pause of is this thing authentic or not um, because it seems like that question makes people stop more than is this thing looted or not mm -hmm. uh, and so I try and put in little tips about well even if you're not an expert in this sort of thing here's how you can think about whether or not it's more likely that this thing is genuine or not. Um, one basic one, for example, is looking at the, the seller's other objects for sale. So one ancient ring for sale, maybe. If mm -hmm. the seller has an inventory of like 500 ancient rings, possibly no. a bit suspect. Uh, uh, which is a thing. I am now really into, <laughs> there are all these people advertising Roman and or Viking, sometimes Roman Viking, uh, wedding rings. <laughs> um, it's sort of pretty simple bands or sometimes it's like little hands linking, um, made out of bronze, which is easy, very easy to do um, in modern. My, my absolute favorite is one uh, um, strategy is to say that these have been uh, re-gilded for modern use. So you don't even have to worry about patina. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even have to look old because they've been restored so they, they just look prettier that's amazing yes like okay somebody needs to you know use your you put put on your critical hat uh, and think about this um i'm also thinking about uh <laughs> one of my my quarantine projects might be to write a guide to faking antiquities because i'm very worried what's going to happen to archaeological sites during the coronavirus and the, the economic um recession that's that's really global is that people turn to looting to feed their families in times of economic crisis and i i just want to say why why get the blisters you know uh, you can make them just, and sell sell the ones that you make so yeah. how easy, well, judging that, by ebay it's pretty easy to actually fake this stuff how easy is it to like make your own antiquities i mean judging by the things i've seen it's very easy to make a bad antiquity. You don't even have to look at <laughs> um, it. can be a lot easier than you think. And and I I, I think people think of, well, oh, no, there's going to be all these, you know, detective strategies of someone will scientifically test this. So. But um, scientific testing only exists for certain categories of materials um, to authenticate them. And even for something that can be definitely scientifically tested, like say that with that little terracotta mm -hmm. head thingy, um, it's, it's expensive. So to test that to determine its age would likely cost more than the value of the object. Right. So why would mm -hmm. anyone test it? Plus that one is a, is a good example too, that you could take an ancient bit of pottery sherd um, and sort of carve a little bit in it to make it look like a sculpture. And then- <laughs> And then you've got something very and, special. And we can't tell how recently it's been carved. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So people, what we're saying is for the love of God, don't buy fakes off eBay. Don't buy really any antiquities off eBay. Um, but do take a look and amuse yourselves at the wide variety of fakes that are available. And I think I've said this eight million times on this show before. But if you do want to buy an antiquity, again, don't do it. But if you really want to, there are very wonderful people who will make replicas, as we see over here. Um, you go on eBay and search for replica cuneiform tablet, and you'll find Dr. Jeremiah Peterson, who is an actual trained sumerologist who will write out pretty much whatever you want to in cuneiform and send it to you. And they are beautiful and ethical, and you're not paying $1,200 for something that someone possibly carved in their back garden. Because oh, they cuneiform tablets are its own, like, mwah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I really, yeah. I've seen somewhere just it's very obvious that the person who's made them has no idea what cuneiform actually is because the signs are upside down and back to front and possibly just made up entirely and they're they're a wonder to behold an absolute wonder to behold um and something that you also pointed out um i think last week on twitter to be suspicious of is if someone is selling these things and it has a very open uh, return oh, hang on hey Sorry, everyone. My dog is going nuts. River, come here. You're fine. 
but if someone has a very <laughs> All right, now you have to do it to us. Come on. Oh, then he'll never leave us alone. Yeah, but I, I've been seeing a lot of um, uh, online sellers saying 100%, no questions back, uh, no questions asked, money back, guaranteed if you're at all unsatisfied. Uh, we guarantee it's authentic, so, so send it back to us. We'll uh, just take it back and give you a new one because we have, like you said, 500 uh, <laughs> near identical rings, so. We can yeah, there was that. one very funny listing uh, was somebody put it as a testimonial on their online gallery. Um, someone saying, you know, sending in an email saying, thank you very much for replacing my broken ancient Egyptian figurine. Uh, it, it came broken. And for a non-broken one. Anyway, it's like, oh, my Lord. <laughs> that's, that's a bad sign, actually. They've got a piece of the stock. Um, but yeah, what I, I was confused by this at first, and then I realized, oh, it's so that... Um, their customers don't report them to eBay or whatever um, sales platform or a credit card processing company is selling fakes um, because that's what would happen if they didn't get, um, mm -hmm. we'll have a refund. And that would be disastrous to their business. Whereas just having to refund one person's money then lets you continue selling ridiculous fakes in peace. So I actually wanted to ask, do you have a feel, so having spent so much time looking at these things, do you have a feel for how much is actually being sold because it some of these things you look at them and you think no one is going to buy that but someone must be there must be a market for it otherwise people wouldn't be wouldn't be trying to sell them is this do people actually make real money at this are they successful uh there seem to be various strategies with this so some people some sellers are going for lots of lower volume sales um some people are doing the sort of classic um, online sales technique of you only pay the shipping, you know, the, mm. the price for the thing will be pretty low, but then they'll charge you 20 or something. Or something. Um, from a country where that is, is actual money. Um, so you're earning money in, in euros or dollars in a way that's not open to you usually in that country. Um, and then some people seem to be really gambling on one big sale. So yesterday I was uh, posting about um, an ancient Rome, supposedly ancient Roman ring, um, supposedly showing aliens. Oh God. Which someone was selling for, trying to sell uh, on, on eBay for 40,000 pounds or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> So if they sell that one, they're really- They're good for the year. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we we're going to talk a little bit about um, the statue statue removal uh, activities that have been happening in uh, well around the world really. But before we get onto that, we have a couple of questions that I want to um, ask you because they're they're pertinent to what we've been discussing. So uh, GA Hook says um, essentially, is it safe to say that if it is on eBay, it's a fake? Hobby Lobby worked in the black markets and didn't use eBay. Correct question mark. Hobby Lobby seems to have gone straight to the source. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of feelings about that. Um, it's, I don't think you can say that everything on online sales is uh, a fake because we have seen genuine looted objects for sale there. Um, one, for example, um, when this ancient Roman site of Athamea in Syria was heavily looted during the conflict there. Um, the Apamea was unique in the, not unique, but Apamea had a, a mint. So not, there weren't very many mints in the Roman world that made their own coins. And sort of uniquely, the coins from Apamea didn't seem to have circulated very widely in antiquity. Um, you can find a coin minted in Rome all over the Roman world, but Apamea seems to have been more contained. Um, so after, in the months after the looting, you could see a, a huge uptick in the number of coins minted in Apamea for sale online, mm -hmm. um, which might have been clever forgers taking advantage of that, but I think was probably actually the, the results of looting. Mm -hmm. um, and we see obvious fakes mixed in with not so obvious things that, that might be genuine. So it's a, also a good sort of investment strategy to mix in some fakes with your 
genuine looted antiquities to kind of increase your profit. Um, so I, I don't think we can think of online sales as just funny um, or non problematic. Mm -hmm. It really is a way for um, people to sell maybe the smaller fines that they found while looting. And much more problematically, I think online sales set this expectation that you can sell an unprovenanced antiquity for a bunch of money. Um, and that kind of expectation is what drives people to go out and loot, even if they don't find anything, even if all they succeed in doing is um, destroying an archeological site, a tomb, maybe finding a few coins or whatever, not the, the thing that they wanted to sell, but the market drives looting, whether or not the market is obviously fake or obviously genuine. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say, actually, related to that question, even though Hobby Lobby wasn't using eBay, it was recently reported that their collection of Dead Sea Scrolls are entirely fake. So even if you're going through, I don't want to say proper channels, because the way Hobby Lobby acquired much of their material is, is highly questionable. But even if you are trying not to buy off eBay or, or buy from a more reputable dealers, um, you can still very easily end up with um, objects that are fakes, that are stolen and looted. And um, this is something that is absolutely fraught with like risks and dangers and just don't do it. <laughs> I need a sign for this, just don't do it. The, the, the Hobby Lobby Dead Sea Scrolls, I mean, it's hilarious because they seem to have been pretty terrible fakes as well, but um, they were donated to the Museum of the Bible by Hobby Lobby by the Steve Green family. So it's unknown if he took a tax deduction from that um, donation, but that if there was a tax deduction there, it could have been in the millions and it would have been funded by taxpayers. So um, fakes in museums are problematic because we're all paying for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um... <laughs> We have a question from Stupid Oil Energy who sends us five dollars, for which I am very grateful. Um, how much does an Inc Incan artifact depicting a Brontosaurus go for these days? Oh, I need a link. I want to <laughs> Sarah, if you have one, I would love to see it. I suspect that you don't, and you're being funny, but that would be absolutely amazing. I did um, uh, um, search ancient aliens in the antiquities section of eBay this week and got quite a few results. Those, those are actually going for, for higher prices. Oh, well, yeah. there we go. People, if you're going to be faking antiquities, aliens. Think aliens. of this one. Yeah. yeah. And possibly dinosaurs. I mean, <laughs> my two-year-old would be thrilled to have anything with a dinosaur in it. So if you're looking to tap into the toddler market, that's the end you need to be okay. going at. Um, so I did also want to talk to you about um, the the statues, and I mentioned <laughs> your denouncement uh, by popular Fox News host um, for your comments on Twitter about the removal of um, of historical statues, specifically um, the statues celebrating slavers and, and members of the U.S. Confederacy. Um, what are you? <sighs> People obviously find the removal of statues problematic and, and discuss it in terms of erasing history. And um, if we just take these things down, then we're essentially pretending that um, our past was not as problematic as it is. Why do you think that's a problematic argument? Well, I've been thinking for, for years about the deliberate destruction of cultural heritage and of art. And it's much more complicated than we assume because when you preserve something, when you fight to preserve it, like say an archeological site, um, you also destroy other things. So numerous archeological sites have been excavated by means of evicting the modern population. Take um, the temple of Bel in Palmyra, Syria, which ISIS blew up a couple of years ago. Um, in the, the early 20th century, a, an archeological expedition evicted the entire village, uh, modern village, which had been sheltering inside the walls of the temple complex um, in order to, to excavate it. Or I've been thinking too a lot lately about um, archeological 
excavations in Palestine and how the ancient past is given priority over modern lives. Um, so these aren't simple decisions about what to preserve and what to destroy. Mm -hmm. And, um, sorry, I'm gonna fly. Um, preservation is expensive too, right? So just leaving a statue or an artwork some places isn't costless. You have to be devoting money to its upkeep at the expense of the upkeep of something else. So something that um, people seem to have been shocked by um, to hear from me in the last couple of weeks is how expensive it is um, to pay for the maintenance of Confederate monuments. So taxpayers in America pay millions of dollars uh, a year to um, preserve maintain, you know, mow the grass at parks, uh, mm -hmm. celebrating the Confederacy, restore statues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, meanwhile, incredibly important sites for African-American and Native American history are disintegrating through lack of funding. Um, so I don't think that these are, are simple questions, mm -hmm. um, but they're incredibly fascinating and I, I want to think about them in terms of the whole history of, of destroying um, statues as well. So fall of communism, lots of statues went down or continuing to go down. Um, I actually found it very funny that um, the French president, Macron, um, a couple of weeks ago said something like, the French Republic does not erase history, does not topple statues. And I'm like, hello. You know, thousands of French revolutionaries are spinning in their graves because that's the mm -hmm. first thing they did. Um, this is try aristocratic art. Um, think about um, uh, protests in the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Um, think about in, in America pulling down statues of King George upon the revolution. Um, this, is, this is how we do it. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, fight ideas by fighting symbols uh, and a lot of uh, we we don't forget the history we forget the the violence of the transition of the history mm -hmm. often because new regimes build new statues new architecture new symbols to replace the fallen symbols so it doesn't seem like an aesthetic loss versus when people who have less power attack something it's called vandalism because they're seen as as taking away aesthetic pleasure without replacing it with anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm. it seems like what's been happening around the world in the last few weeks is uh, people banding together to realize, even if we don't know what comes next, um, removing these symbols that are, are painful is something we need to either do or, or, or talk about in a way that gives hope rather than fruitless committee discussions mm -hmm. for, for decades because these are these are things that have been discussed for a lot like as long as i've been in the united states at least and far longer than that so um it it feels as though this is an ongoing conversation that hasn't actually produced any change and i think is, is probably very frustrating to people um who are arguing that um we can remember um the history and remember the past and and the painful past without also commemorating the people who are responsible for the enslavement of, of so many others and for, for those kinds of atrocities. Um, I'm actually seeing a question um, if I thought it would help if government regulation forced companies like Amazon and eBay to be more proactive about fake antiquities. And I want to say like eBay is actually very on top of this. Um, if you report a listing. So you can just mm -hmm. click on report, say that something is a replica. They, they actually, um, uh, eBay, ask eBay on Twitter, replied to me very quickly about this whole AIA mm -hmm. fake little head thing and said, well, here's how you do the, the report, all the steps. Um, and then they will investigate a listing. So uh, I really encourage everybody because it's hilarious to look at them and then report them. Uh, and this will actually help uh, I think the the fight against this market that encourages looting in your own Absolutely. way while being able to laugh. <laughs> and it's a, an amusing way to kill 20 minutes. Why not? Um, well, so I am actually out of questions. Is there anything in particular you wanted to discuss or bring up while we're here? 
Hmm. Let's see. Uh, I just to continue what I was saying. I mean, mm. I, art crime is something that I get to make up every day. What I study, <laughs> and there aren't a lot of people who do it. So I really encourage you know amateur detectiveness, side gigging. Um, getting really into it as a, as a hobby. Like there's a lot of room and a lot of difference that can be made mm -hmm. um, through reporting things, keeping an eye on archeological sites, um, educating people who are buying things up to writing up ads or contacting museums to ask, hey, this museum label seems exclusionary or makes me on comfortable or doesn't seem to account for this or that or whatever. Yeah, you know, museums are listening these days, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully more. Um, and this is the type of feedback that has a uh, direct change, I think. So for example, um, last, man, time has no meaning. Was it last? <laughs> it doesn't. Or, do that. I don't know. A couple of months ago, uh, I wrote a Twitter thread about um, a museum having on display an, a Nepali statue that was stolen uh, in the 1980s um, with proof that it had been stolen. And the museum took it off display in a few days and, and said that they're working with the Nepali government for repatriation wow. negotiations. So social media can be really powerful because mm -hmm. um, Museums uh, and collectors are really in a moment of rethinking what's right, and um, public pressure is definitely a part of that. That is the the sole reason why people um, look for Nazi looted provenance, uh, but don't seem to care about colonial era takings yet, because there's a lot of public pressure and agreement that one thing is not cool, and there needs to be more public pressure and agreement that other forms of, of non-ethical taking are non-ethical and then we'll see real change. Fantastic, thank you. So there we go, everybody, go to eBay, report everything you find um, and talk to museums and, and question their practices if you find them uncomfortable or, or if you think they should be revised and reviewed. Um, wonderful, thank you so much. It's been lovely to chat to you. Um, everybody, please, if you are on Twitter, go and take a look uh, at Dr. Thompson's Twitter feed because it's both very informative and highly amusing. Um, the link to her book is also in the description box below. So if you are interested in this topic, definitely take a look at that as well. Um, and tomorrow, if you are free at around 4 p.m. EST, Josh is going to be talking to Dr. Joel Baden about the formation of the Pentateuch. Uh, and then on Saturday, I will be talking uh, to, that's a great question, uh, talking to Bettina Joy de Guzman, sorry, mind went, um, about uh, her work as um, a musician reconstructing ancient music. So that both of those are going to be very interesting. Um, thank you again to Dr. Thompson. Thank you to all of you for watching. And until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how would you know that? <laughs>